Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the stripes of linen lying, lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not been understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciple went back to where they were staying. Verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Um, well, once again, welcome. Um, if we've not met, there are a few faces that I don't recognize, so it's really wonderful. Welcome, especially if it's your first time here. My name is Andrew, and I'm a member of the team at St. Helens. Well, let me pray, and then let's take a look at this passage together. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you this Easter that we do not wake up to a world in which there is no hope, but because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, there is hope. And we have that. We have that in your word. We have it clearly. And we pray, Lord, that as we look at it this morning, you would grow faith, grow hope in each and every one of us. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was a kid, I didn't really get Easter. Um, I think if, if you're a big fan of chocolate, then I suppose Easter is quite exciting. I was never a massive fan of chocolate. Christmas, I understood. Christmas, you asked your parents for stuff, and if you were lucky, you got it, or at least if you didn't get exactly what you wanted because what you asked for was ridiculous, then at least you got something. You got presents at Christmas. Christmas was exciting. Easter was chocolate. And you can tell how kind of, I guess, unromantic I was about the idea of that, that one year I tried to persuade my parents to give me the money that they would have spent on Easter eggs for me so that I could then go and buy Easter eggs for myself half price after Easter because you knew they'd always be on discount because that way I'd get twice as much chocolate. What then is Easter about? The BBC had an article um, which uh, I was very interested by the headline. It said, how to make Easter mean more. How to make Easter mean more. Implication, Easter doesn't mean very much. But anyway, here we go. It says, Easter is the most significant event in the Christian calendar, but its message of new beginnings, hope and redemption are universal and can be appreciated by everyone. The idea of a rebirth, 
resurrection or a fresh start is one that we can all appreciate. It can be hard to make big changes in life, but spring presents the perfect time to get a new job, mend or end a relationship, or move house. How to make Easter mean more. I think I might want to argue that's how to make Easter mean less. Because that's great, isn't it? I'm all for a fresh start. Fresh starts are great. Turn over a new leaf, whatever it is. But it's not enough, is it? As we move slowly, painfully, progressively towards the end of lockdown, which most of us are looking forward to, many of us have faced losses this last year. Almost all of us will not have been able to spend as much time with those that we love, particularly those that don't live in the same town or city as us. Many people have lost their jobs, lost businesses, lost livelihoods. And of course, for many, and some in our midst, some here this morning, have lost family and friends who they'll never see again. What we've lost is gone. That time is gone. Those people are gone. And a little bit of positive thinking, the perfect time to get a new job, mend or end a relationship, or move house. Well, it's not enough, is it? But if, if 2,000 years ago, there was a man who was dead on a cross on the Friday, nails through his hands, a spear pushed into his side just to make sure he was dead. In the tomb on the Saturday, heart stopped, blood congealing, organs decaying. But on the Sunday, on the Sunday he was alive, heart pumping, blood flowing, standing in the light of a new day, more alive than he had ever been. If that's true, then there's a hope beyond the worst that can happen to us. There's a hope beyond death. And that is the message of Christianity, not just a bit of positive thinking, but that if the tomb of Jesus Christ was empty, then life would never be the same again. Well, let's turn to our account in John chapter 20. As I say, if you've got a Bible or a smartphone with a Bible app on it, you're welcome to follow along. If not, don't worry, I'll read the verses. So Jesus had been tried in the early, early hours of Friday morning by a kangaroo court, handed over to the Roman authorities, beaten, mocked, spat on, and then crucified, nailed to a wooden cross, and hung up to die. At the end of chapter 19, we read this, Joseph of Ar Arimathea, with Pilate's permission, came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, who brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, with which he anointed the dead body, about 35 kilograms. That's pretty heavy for most of us. 35 kilograms of sort of thick liquid spices, myrrh and aloes, which they covered over Jesus' body, including his face, wrapped him in linen, and placed him in a tomb. John writes, this was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. So they take down Jesus' body, still covered in the injuries from his beating, with the nail marks, with the steer marks, spear mark, wrapped him in spices and linen, and put him in a cold tomb and shut him in. And then Saturday, the Sabbath, not allowed to travel, and certainly not allowed to visit a cemetery, a place of death and uncleanness. Surely the longest Sabbath day of their lives, a day of mourning and questioning, of confusion and suffering and pain. Why Jesus? Why their master? Why their friend? Why like this? How could God let something so terrible happen? I thought he loved us. I thought he cared for us. And then we read John chapter 20, early on the first day of the week, so the Sunday, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Now there was no way that Mary would have been able to roll the immense stone out of the way. It would have weighed a couple of tons. Such tombs were designed to frustrate grave robbers once you'd rolled the stone down a slope and it was settled there. Moving it again was almost impossible. All Mary would be able to do was look, sit, grieve question again, what had gone wrong? 
but just to be as close as possible to the one that she loved, to the one who had loved her. Mary didn't go expecting a miracle. I think this is almost a problem for us as we come to Easter. We've already said Christ has risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. That is not what Mary was expecting. She was just expecting to sit and weep at the tomb. But instead, this is what she saw. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. But she doesn't go further. At that point, she probably suspected grave robbers. And so very wisely, she runs. And she runs back. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, that is John, the author of this gospel, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Now notice what Mary doesn't say. Mary doesn't say, Jesus has risen. Mary says, they've taken him away. She was not expecting him to be alive. Peter and John weren't expecting him to be alive either. They didn't say, well, of course, that's because he said he'd rise. No. Instead, we don't know exactly what they're thinking, but probably something along the lines of someone's stolen the body. Quick, let's get there. And if we get there in time, maybe we can catch up with them. Verse 3, so Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. And here we get a bit of a personality profile of John and Peter. John, the younger guy, gets there first, but when he gets there, he just kind of peers in and looks. But Peter arrives and in character just rushes straight on in. But even as John looks into the tomb, what he sees doesn't fit with a grave robbery. If you are grave robbers, and the emperor had, had, had made a law that if you robbed graves, the penalty was death. So if you're grave robbers, you want to get away with it. So you get in there, you grab it, you get out there. You don't stop and slowly unwrap the body from all the strips of linen, put them neatly in two piles, the bits from the body in one place, the bit from the head in another place, and then carry the body away. You just grab what you can and you get out of there. But instead, John looks in and he sees the strips of linen. And then Simon Peter, verse 6, came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, John, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. So something about what John saw caused him to believe. But interestingly, John, again, who's writing this, comments on his own belief. Verse 9, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. As if to say, we weren't expecting this. He still wasn't expecting at that time. They still hadn't understood from the Scriptures that Jesus was, had to rise from the dead. It was on the basis of what he saw. So why was the tomb empty? Well, people have commonly given three options why the tomb is empty. The first one is that, well, this is all made up, and Jesus' friends stole the body so that there would be an empty tomb in order to invent a religion. But that doesn't fit with the facts, because G Jesus' disciples didn't then go on to lives of glory and power and honor, but they went on to lives of suffering and difficulty and persecution. You may know the name Chuck Colson. He was sent to prison for his part in the Watergate scandal. He was one of the 12 men who knew what had gone on and who committed together that they would keep it secret, and within three weeks it was out. He said this. He became a Christian while he was in prison. He said this. 12 men testified that they'd seen Jesus raised from the dead, and they proclaimed it for 40 years, never once denying it despite beatings and torture. In Watergate... 12 of the most powerful men in the world couldn't keep a lie for three weeks. But 12 apostles could keep a lie for 40 years? Impossible. Someone would have cracked, just as we did in Watergate. There would have been some kind of smoking gun or deathbed confession. So why didn't they crack? Because they had come face to face with the living God. They could not deny what they had seen. No one will give their life for what they know is a lie, but people will give their life for what they know is true. 
so Jesus' disciples, it makes no sense for them to have taken the body. Well, what about Jesus' enemies? Did they steal the body? Well, that makes even less sense because as Christianity then went from strength to strength, if the religious authorities could have done anything to prove that Jesus was still dead, then they would have just brought that body out and shown it. Well, the third option is that Jesus rose from the dead. And if Jesus did rise from the dead, well, then life would never be the same again. And that is what John concludes, something that he sees, and we'll see more next week as we look on and see Jesus appearing to all the disciples again and famously to Doubting Thomas. So John has concluded that. But Mary, and we don't know whether Mary made it back in time to see Peter and John or whether they'd left before she arrives. But either way, Mary doesn't yet believe. So we pick up again with Mary. And Mary, the only other thing we know about Mary Magdalene from the scriptures is from Luke, Luke chapter 8, where we're told this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, also Joanna, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support Jesus and the disciples out of their own means. That is, Mary Magdalene was one of those who was traveling around with Jesus and the disciples, paying for his ministry. And Mary is one of those. She is last at the cross and first at the tomb. What would it have meant for Mary if Jesus hadn't risen? Jesus had freed her from her former life. Jesus had declared her sins forgiven. She had given up her life, her standard life, to travel with Jesus, to provide for him financially, to provide for his apostles. And now, as far as she knows, it's all over. Jesus is dead, all her hopes dashed, all the promises of something better, just a mirage, just another, I hoped this time it would be different, but it's not. It looked like she'd given up her life for nothing, her sins unforgiven, her future uncertain. When the life flowed from Jesus' body, it looked like his mission failed. And now even worse for her, Jesus' body has been taken. She can't even grieve properly. And so verse 11 we read, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And there's different words for crying in Greek. This is constant, unrestrained weeping, gut-wrenching, shoulder-shaking, shuddering, grasping, weeping. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. Mary still isn't saying Jesus has risen. She still thinks someone's taken his body away. And then as she looks in, at the angels, something behind her, or possibly something on their expression, makes her turn. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, Mary said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. We don't know why Mary didn't recognize Jesus in some of the other accounts of people seeing the risen Jesus. They also didn't recognize him. So it might have been a, a, a Jesus deliberately withholding his appearance from him, from, from her at that time. Or it might just have been that with the tears covering her eyes, perhaps the light was behind him. She wasn't expecting it. She still doesn't believe. And then everything changes in verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary. That one word, her name, from a voice she knew with the familiar intonation, one who knew her completely with that one word, Mary, everything changed. What did it mean that Jesus had risen, was not dead, but had risen, her sins forgiven, her past forgotten, her future secure. Whatever would come now, she would be able to face it in the light of Jesus' resurrection. She turned towards him, John writes, and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means my teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, 
to my God and your God. Now, Jesus isn't saying, don't touch me, you can't touch me. Later, when Jesus appears to Thomas, he says, look, you want proof? Put your finger in the nail holes, put your hand in my side. Jesus was a physically resurrected person. He could be touched. But Jesus says to Mary, don't hold on to me. Mary, you want things to go back to how they were before, but actually something new and greater is happening. Go to my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. C.S. Lewis wrote, the resurrection is the beginning of the new creation. A new chapter in cosmic history has opened. It seems Mary was happy just for things to go back to how they were before. And it's been interesting as we're, again, steadily coming out of lockdown. Again, another article on the BBC, the countdown to freedom, it said. And I think there's a lot of longing for life to go back to normal, to return to the things that we used to enjoy. But I wonder if we're forgetting what the old normal was like. Go back 18 months, two years, very few of us were saying, life is amazing, everything is fantastic, and the world is a beautiful place. Life was hard before lockdown, and it won't be magically easy as soon as lockdown ends. Just going back to how things were will help no one, ultimately. And I've been reflecting recently, for Grace and myself, there just seems to have been a lot of pain in those close to us in recent times. And most of the things that have happened to our families, our friends, our community here as a church, most of the things that have been hardest during lockdown haven't been because of lockdown and won't go away once lockdown is over. One of my very best friends had to sit down with his wife and his children the other day and explain with his wife to his children why they're getting a divorce. Ten years of marriage and those children, primary school age children, now having to grow up with their mother and father no longer together. One of Grace's best friends whose fiance called off their wedding two weeks before the date. Grieving, a lost future, the lost hope, all that would have come with that relationship. Our friend, our brother, Adrian, who we've prayed for already today, undergoing chemotherapy, not knowing yet what the future will hold. And we think, of course, of Sue having lost Chris, of Lorette and the girls having lost Marsha, of Rasa having lost her mum recently. Or think bigger, think of Richard Okageye locally, think of Sarah Everard, think of George Floyd, nothing to do with lockdown, particularly any of those things, and nothing that will be fixed as soon as lockdown is over. Just going back to how things at were will help no one ultimately. We need something bigger and something better. Jesus said to Mary, do not hold on to me. I have not yet ascended to my father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. There is hope for a better world because 2,000 years ago there was a man who was dead on the Friday in a tomb on the Saturday but alive again on the Sunday which brings hope for a better world that is open to all, open to any, not forced on anyone. We have to choose it, we have to say yes, we have to opt in And not the promise of an easy life now, not the promise that things here will be easy now or when lockdown is over, but a guarantee that because Jesus has risen, if we put our trust in him, we too will rise. A promise that one day a better world will come. Now, if you're a skeptic uh, listening in this morning, whether in the building or online, well, firstly, welcome. Skepticism has a long and great history. As I said, we'll be looking at Doubting Thomas next week. And secondly, I realize that, that what we've looked at this morning, that the, the tomb was empty. There were linen rags left behind. Mary said that she saw Jesus and someone wrote it down. 
Well, this alone may not be enough to convince you. And you may have so many other questions. Can we trust the gospel writers? How do we know that the Bible wasn't changed over the centuries between then and now? Did Jesus really die? Maybe it was just a resuscitation, not a resurrection. Did anyone else see him alive? Or conveniently, was it just his best friends? Or maybe a host of other questions. And I want to say, investigate all of those questions. And we would love to help you. We run courses, come back, an come back another Sunday, come back next Sunday, watch again online, and check out other sermons that we've done on these kind of topics. We've got books that you can read. And start with the question of today, did Jesus rise from the dead? Because if Jesus did rise from the dead, then everything else flows from that. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then Christianity is a waste of time. Walk away. But if Jesus did rise from the dead, then it changes everything. If there were no resurrection, we ourselves could not be raised, but the Son of God is living, so our hope is not in vain. Uh, a book I enjoy turning to um, on this topic is a, is a book called A History of Thought. It's by a French atheist and philosopher, Luc Ferry. He writes, sorry for the pronunciation, Michel. He writes that the central question of all philosophy concerns this proposition, that the human being is mortal, that we know that we will die, and that our near ones, those we love, will also die. And in his book, he goes on to lay out his own humanism, as well as to examine and reject other worldviews, including Buddhism, Buddhism and Stoicism as philosophies for life. Towards the end of the book, he writes this. I find the Christian proposition infinitely more tempting, except that I do not believe it to be true. But were it to be true, I would certainly be a taker. I remember my friend, the atheist and historian Francois Furet, being asked on television whether he would wish God, what he would wish God to say to him, were they ever to meet, to which he gave an immediate answer, come quickly, your loved ones are waiting for you. I would have given the same answer. Amongst the available doctrines of salvation, nothing can compete with Christianity. Luke Ferry, atheist. It is true. It is true. Not an abstract hope. Easter, not the perfect time to get a new job, amend or end a relationship or move house, but the promise of a new world, no suffering, or sickness, or brokenness, or death. Restored relationships, open to all, that is true hope this Easter.